The Department of Marine Resources, with the help of the Bahamas Reef Environment Educational Foundation, the Nature Conservancy, the Bahamas National Trust, and the College of the Bahamas Marine and Environmental Studies Institute, have started a research project to determine the status of the Nassau grouper fishery in the Bahamas, along with a number of other objectives. Actually, at the outset, that was the main aim, to um, head towards a set closed season for the grouper. Um, in lieu of the fact that we have received other suggestions from the various fishermen who are saying that they know where all the group of school, they know when they school, and the fact that um, they're saying um, that not all the group of school in the same, at the same time, but they are different parts of the country, they school at different times. And that is one of the reasons why Dr. Sadovi is here right now. She's here um, during the group of close season to and during the aggregation time to check and see if this is actually happening. Yeah, well, the survey um, is being undertaken to basically um, strengthen the knowledge base of the Department of Marine Resources with respect to the uh, occurrence of spawning aggregations for Nassau groupers and for other important uh, species in the waters of the Bahamas. The information that will be gathered will be from a variety of different fishermen from various age groups and will reflect their opinions and experiences of fishing throughout the years. And then our main role will be in the quality control process and establishing hopefully a digital online database where people into the future can download this information, compare past fishermen interviews to current fishermen interviews and help us overcome this problem of the shifting baseline. We felt it was important to interview fishermen because they're the ones who are actually out there observing the different things that are happening in the fishery. They know how their catches have changed over time, how the size of their fish has changed over time, how much effort it takes them to catch a certain amount compared to the past. All that has scientific value. It has to be quantified properly and you can make certain conclusions based on that information. We are creating a survey for specifically for fishermen, and we're not looking just at our commercial fishermen, but fishermen in general, because we want to know, um, even for the recreational fishermen, how have they, how, how are their feelings towards the closures, and just the population status of the Nassau group over time. Lending a helping and guiding hand in the creation of this survey was Dr. Yvonne Sadovi, director of the Society for the Conservation of Reef Fish Aggregations and professor at the University of Hong Kong. Dr. Sadovi brings international expertise. Um, why bother to make the mistakes when we can learn from others' mistakes? So we definitely don't want to go down the line that other countries have and that most places, NASA groupers are commercially extinct. We want to learn from their mistakes. And also she's able to share the successes as well. So we want to learn from mistakes and the successes of other countries. Over the last few decades, I've been involved in a number of projects around the world on spawning aggregations. Within the Caribbean region, uh, when I worked in Puerto Rico, uh, I was involved in biological studies and fishery uh, management work on the red hind, which is another species of aggregating grouper. And although it took about 10 years, a lot of that early work that I was involved in resulted in management of the species. Globally, I've also been involved in projects in Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific. And people got so interested in this particular work that they started also discussing uh, marine protected area management on a much wider scale. So the aggregation work actually precipitated uh, wider management and conservation work. With Dr. Sadovi's assistance, the Department of Marine Resources held a training workshop and is developing a survey that will obtain the appropriate information from fishermen. Currently, we're drafting our survey um, so we were able, to, and also training our, our fisheries officers as well as different entities that will be assisting us in this initiative. So we wanna, we're not just capturing data or information from New Providence, it's widespread whereas offices in different locations throughout the Bahamas on different islands are able to be trained in learning the survey and how to go about with the rapport with our fishermen. So once that is completed, the surveys will be distributed through several islands and of course additional training to persons that maybe who haven't attended the workshop itself but who has a close relationship with fishermen who are able to capture the same information that's important to us facilitated in the survey.
um, Dr. Yvonne Sadovi has worldwide experience in conducting surveys of this type. Um, there's a way to ask questions of fishermen uh, to get the scientific information that you need. Um, you have to try to eliminate biases such as leading them to the answer of they want it to be open-ended type answers where they basically tell us truthfully what's on their mind and there's a scientific way of doing that. She's assisting with that. After the training, it's hoped that uh, the Department of Marine Resources staff, along with assistance from a number of non-government organizations, are going to assist in actually interviewing the fishermen, those that currently fish and those who used to fish decades ago, up to 50 years or more. Basically, we want to ascertain how the fishery has changed over time. Research throughout the Caribbean and around the world has shown that unregulated fishing of spawning aggregation sites will inevitably lead to a local collapse of those fishing industries. This has been proven numerous times, particularly with the Nassau grouper. Early on in looking at the um, abundance of groupers and the status of grouper fisheries, there was a sort of domino effect across the Caribbean. Country after country was, was basically uh, declaring their grouper fishery commercially extinct. Uh, this was probably first done in Jamaica, where grouper was the number one landed fish in the 1960s. By the 1970s, it was a very small percentage of the catch and no longer uh, available for commercial fisheries. That was followed by the uh, other islands in the Lesser Antilles, Puerto Rico, and Virgin Islands. After almost 15 years of closure of the grouper fishery in the Florida Keys, Nassau grouper never came back and remain a relatively uh, rare fish uh, on the Florida Keys uh, reefs. The Nassau grouper, or Epinephalus striatus, was named after the capital city of the Bahamas, but it's also a species that was once abundant throughout the region. Other countries have means that they've um, gone into with regard to um, how to control that, uh, for example, issuing fish licenses um, to fishermen, um, not allowing too many fishermen to fish in the country um, by limiting the number of licenses. We have not got to that stage as yet, and maybe we will never get to it, um, but these are measures that have, have been taken by others, and uh, um, ideas that we can look at also in our country. Protecting the fishery before it's too late is an important step for any country to take. This is because it's easier to protect the industry than it is to try and rebuild it. There was uh, a project developed by fisheries biologists in the Virgin Islands to see what would it take to restore a spawning aggregation. They had, at that time, people in Florida could raise Nassau groupers, though it was very expensive, uh, in tanks. They could raise them uh, from eggs and sperm stripped from fertile uh, adults, males and females, and raise up the uh, juvenile Nassau groupers. Um, and so there was some thought that they could use mariculture to raise up groupers, keep them in pens out in the ocean, and then uh, use uh, injected hormones to get the fish um, spawning ready and to interact and spawn. Now, all of this was theoretical and very expensive. It was tens of millions of dollars, and uh, there was never really the funding available. This is the problem we face in fisheries uh, throughout the Caribbean. We would never have the funding available to restore habitat, restore stocks. Seeing the potential outcomes of unregulated aggregation fishing, the government is aware that there is a need to take action now as opposed to later. The, the government is um, uh, minded to try and control um, the fishing within the country to ensure that we have fish for as long as, as, long as we are around. Um, as Dr. Sadabi would have mentioned in her presentation earlier this week, um, when there are, if you wait until there are no more fish, it's a bit too late then to, um, to, to get into trying to correct the situation. So our aim in the Bahamas right now is to try and correct it before it gets out of our hands. In the Bahamas, there is an abundance of anecdotal information concerning the status of Bahamian fisheries. There are some older fishermen who agree that there is a change in the quantity and size of NASA groupers that are landed. However, there are many younger fishermen who feel that there is no noticeable change in the fisheries to date. This argument is at the heart of the research project that is being undertaken.
In her studies around the world, Dr. Sadovi has encountered this argument numerous times. During my work both here and in Asia, we often encounter problems with explaining that fisheries can actually decline. That if you don't see fish in a particular area anymore, if that's the experience of the fishermen, then the reason for that, the explanation for that, is that there are actually fewer fish in the sea. And the reason that seems to be such a problem for many fishermen to accept is that many believe that when fish are no longer visible, they're actually somewhere else. It's not that there's fewer of them, there are literally somewhere else. So many fishermen believe that fish go deeper than that they can't catch them, or that fish go to other places and so they can't catch them. So one of the, the big problems for biologists and managers to, uh, to have to deal with is to be able to explain to fishing communities why it is that there's fewer fish in the seas. And it's not because they've gone deeper, it's not because they've gone somewhere else, it's because there are actually fewer fish. And bridging this uh, information gap is extremely important for people to be able to really understand what's happening to their fishery. During her research, Dr. Sadovi has recognized a disturbing trend that puts the fisheries of a country in jeopardy. She has created a theory that describes this trend. One of the major challenges to managing species that aggregate to spawn, like the Nassau grouper, is that when most of the landings come from aggregations, people see those landings and they see the docks and the boats full of fish. And so this is what I call a, an illusion of plenty, an illusion that just because you have lots and lots of fish on the dock, lots and lots of fish in the boat, that there must be lots and lots of fish out there. And dispelling this illusion of plenty is a major challenge to managing this particular fishery. Like Dr. Sadovi, many other scientists have discovered that as fishing on spawning aggregation sites continues, the number of fish landed stays relatively the same until it reaches a turning point where it crashes completely. This scenario has unfolded numerous times with the NASA group of fisheries in other countries around the world. In order to raise awareness of the importance of protecting the Nassau grouper, the Department of Marine Resources, along with environmental organizations like the Bahamas Reef Environment Educational Foundation and the Bahamas National Trust, have been sending out pamphlets, posters, and other educational material to help inform people of the plight of the Nassau grouper. Uh, part of what we do at the Department of Marine Resources is try to educate the public as well. It's important for people to understand why we have restrictions in place that ultimately is to their benefit and for future generations. Uh, some of the materials that you'll see coming out of the department, uh, we have a website that we hope to have up and running very soon. Uh, we also uh, conduct lectures. Anybody who requests that an officer come in and speak to them, we generally oblige them to come in and speak on whatever topic they, they request. We also have a number of pamphlets I'm not only dealing with NASA group, other important fisheries such as conch, lobster, many different areas, and fishing in general in the Bahamas. It's important to share information with the public about this particularly vulnerable species and get public involvement in protecting it so that we really can make sure that we have this species around for generations to come. And we feel very strongly that if people understand why the species is vulnerable to overfishing, why it has collapsed in other places around the region, then they will get behind and support the measures that the Bahamas is now putting in place to protect this species. Reef employs several strategies to get information to the public out about Nassau Grouper. Um, these include uh, marine conservation teacher training workshop, which is held each summer in San Salvador. At that time, we bring about 30 teachers, teach them about the marine environment, and one essential component of that is the study of the Nassau Grouper. Um, these teachers then in turn take this information back to their schools and share it with their colleagues and with their students. Um, this past summer, the teachers produced a special resource for use throughout the schools on a Nassau grouper. It's a short film that looked at different aspects of the Nassau grouper, um, such as its life cycle, how to identify a Nassau grouper, um, what are the threats posed to it, and what we can all do in order to ensure that we, have, we will continue to have Nassau grouper in the future. Uh, in addition to this, we have other initiatives. We, um, try our best to get to prepare educational materials 
that we send out to the general public, we make them available um, to the public through other partnership partner agencies such as the Bahamas National Trust, the Department of Marine Resources, the Nature Conservancy. So we try to have uh, information out there and we send them out to the schools as well. In fact, I've gone to do presentations as the environmental educator at Brief and the kids have shared with me that yes, we heard about the NASA Grouper and that they've seen the DVD, so we know it's definitely being used. We also produce a series of public service announcements with local school kids, again relying on our extensive network of teachers who have passed through uh, workshops. We were able to get the support of schools to have students create and record public service announcements. It's important for Bahamians to recognize the importance of the NASA grouper, not only as a part of the marine environment, but also as a part of the Bahamian lifestyle. The NASA grouper fisheries of great economic importance and that it provides an income for people in hard times. A lot of people feel that if they lose their job or they need to supplement their income, if they're undergoing hard times, they can fish. And of course, the NASA group is one of those fish of a pretty high value that they can target. Um, also, in terms of people staying in the family islands, finding something to do to earn an income, there, if the, all fisheries, not only NASA group, are managed sustainably, um, they can avoid, avoid coming to the capital to seek employment. It's a way to supplement their income or help them to remain where they are, basically. The Nassau grouper is important ecologically because it's a predator on the reef. In fact, if you were a small fish living on the reef, you'd be pretty scared to have a Nassau grouper nearby because they're carnivores and they eat a lot of small fish and crabs and other crustaceans. So they keep the ecosystem in balance. And there also seems to be evidence now that they are consuming some of the invasive lionfish, which is becoming more and more common on reefs in the Bahamas and around the region. So they may play an important role in keeping this lionfish invasion in check. During her time in the Bahamas, Dr. Sadovi helped Brief and the Department of Marine Resources spread the word about the importance of protecting the Nassau grouper. During Dr. Sadovi's stay, she made several radio appearances on ZNS, Island FM, and Star 106, when, during which she shared information on the Nassau grouper, um, the situation with fishing on spawning aggregations, and also shared some of the experiences of other countries. She also spoke with the students at the C.V. Bethel Senior High School, in particular those of the Marine Science Magnet Program, where they're, they're, they're learning about the marine environment and how to care for it. Dr. Sadovi also did a lecture at the Bahamas National Trust, where she talked about the management strategies for Nassau Grouper and again drew on examples of what's happening with the fisheries in many countries in our region. She also expressed the keen interest that other countries have on the work that the Bahamas is doing to protect the Nassau Grouper. Since 1998, the Bahamas has been looking at the Nassau Grouper fishery. It's a very important fishery within the country. And there's been a build-up of uh, initiatives to protect aggregations, starting with uh, uh, seasonal closures, um, including a few site closures, and looking for a national closure on a long-term basis. The precedent that the Bahamas is setting in these initiatives is extremely important in the region. It's viewed favorably because it sets a very good precedent for management intervention for this particular species because seasonal closures are so important for aggregating species, especially if those closures are associated with sales bans. But it's also extremely important for the Nassau grouper. What the Bahamas is doing may be critical for the long-term survival of a viable fishery of this particular species, because it seems to be the last country where numbers occur in any healthy numbers. So we're very excited about what the Bahamas is doing and we wish it every success in these initiatives. With the steps that were taken in the past and the positive outcome of this research project, the future of the Nassau Grouper looks bright here in the Bahamas. I believe that from the information that's available on landings, so looking at the sizes of the fish in the landings, and the amount of landings that some fishermen seem to be still getting, that there's a very bright future for this species in this region if 
the management interventions being considered um, on a long-term basis are introduced effectively. And when I say effectively, I, I mean that the problems that have been identified and that are of such concern to so many, the problem of poaching over across international waters, that clearly needs to be solved. I think the other important component of success within the Bahamas is that a wider range of people within the society understand the problems with the species and the real need to protect it. And I'm extremely hopeful that if those problems are solved, the 